Dr. Robert Knight is an environmental scientist with more than 35 years of professional experience in Florida. He is the founder and director of the Howard T. Odom Florida Springs Institute, a nonprofit program dedicated to supporting science and education necessary for restoration and wise management of Florida's artesian springs. Dr. Knight is an adjunct professor in the Department of Environmental Engineering Sciences at the University of Florida, where he teaches a graduate level course on the ecology of springs. Dr. Knight is also currently active on restoration efforts for the Santa Fe River Springs, Crystal River Springs, Ichnituckney Springs, and Silver Springs. He's on the board of directors for both the Silver River Alliance and the Wakulla Springs Alliance, two citizen advocacy organizations. Welcome, Dr. Knight. Glad to be here. I had the pleasure of being uh, at the County Commission meeting a couple of weeks ago when you gave your presentation on the Santa Fe Springs Restoration Action Plan. It was uh, very informative and I thought it would be good to get you on and let us let you tell us a little bit more about this. Um, why don't we start just with an overview of, of the springs and mm -hmm. why they're important to, uh, to folks locally? All right. Um, Alachua County and North Florida in general is blessed with a very high abundance of springs. And we have over a thousand artesian springs now recognized in Florida by the Florida Geological Survey. That's the highest concentration we think anywhere in the world. And many of the largest springs in the world are in North Florida. So this is sort of the secret hidden pleasure of North Florida that we have springs to go to in our hot summertime uh, while others in other parts of the state go to the beach or go to the keys we go to the springs and uh, I, I you know they're just the secret hideaway for floridians but they've also been discovered by the world uh, scuba divers from over 40 countries come to the springs of north florida the very best uh, cave diving in the world is much of it's in florida in our springs um, we have people coming from the coastal areas to Itchituckney, for example, from Jacksonville on a regular basis up all the way from West Palm Beach coming up the Itchituckney to tube on that magnificent river where you're actually immersed in a whole river of spring water, basically a living aquarium on a, just a gigantic size. Um, and we have many businesses that are dependent on the springs. Uh, we have some bottling plants, water bottling plants that are clearly dependent on the reputation of clean springs water. Uh, we have several private springs in the, the area on the Santa Fe River that derive a lot of revenue from campers and uh, recreationalists who want to spend their time at the springs. Has there been a uh, <coughs> economic study? I mean, do we know what the economic impact of all of that is? Uh, overall, in the state of Florida, we just have a rough estimate of about $300 million a year from the springs that are in state parks. Um, the, in Alachua County, we have a Alachua County Park, Post Springs Park, and uh, uh, the revenue from that park and the adjacent parks, uh, Jimmy Springs and uh, Gilchrist Blue Springs, is somewhere in the five to ten million dollar a year range. Uh, the additional revenues from uh, the businesses are uh, many millions of dollars. So we estimated for the Santa Fe River Springs, which are not the most developed springs in the state and do not include the Itchituckney Springs about $20 million of direct economic revenue. Now, you mentioned the Santa Fe River Springs. I is there a way you can kind of describe to us what that area is? Yeah, the Santa Fe River is uh, the largest tributary to the Suwannee River, which is one of the largest rivers in Florida. So Santa Fe River is a very significant uh, river. Several thousand square miles feed water to the Santa Fe River, both surface water and groundwater. And I think most people think of the Santa Fe River as a brown or black water river because that's what you see during times of normal rainfall. But during times of low rainfall, uh, the, the base flow and the entire flow of the Santa Fe River is spring flow. And uh, the Santa Fe is, cuts through an area of very karst topography, porous limestone topography, so that we actually have one three-mile stretch of the river that's totally underground. It goes underground under the Lena 
Spring State Park, or Olena State Park, flows three miles underground before it rises again at River Rise, which is essentially a large spring uh, carrying the whole flow of the Santa Fe River. We, uh, we've got a great map that you provided in your presentation to the board, so we'll show folks what that recharge area is that you just talked about. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there is a concern, and it's been all over the news uh, in recent weeks about spring flows declining. Uh, can you kind of address that issue and, and tell us exactly what's going on there? Certainly. Um, it's my unfortunate job right now to evaluate springs during a time of declining health. And uh, one of the most serious problems facing springs is the reduced flows that we have in all our springs, all those that have been measured. Um, we are living in a time of increasing drought, which we don't know if that's due to global warming or other causes, including development as a possible cause for that. So we're in a time of extreme drought. And what happens when you have a drought, it, it, it makes other things more visible because you've stripped away the rainfall that you get uh, that recharges springs. Uh, but what we're seeing now during this period of drought is the lowest flows ever recorded in the springs along the Santa Fe River. Post springs, our, our cherished county spring, Normal flow is 70 cubic feet per second, which is about 50 million gallons a day. It's a lot of water. It's a large, very large spring. Its flow uh, this week was measured at one half of a cubic foot per second. So it's down, essentially it's full flow. It's essentially, if, if we have another week or so of, of low to zero rainfall, it, the post springs is going to stop flowing for the first time in recorded, the recorded record. Um, is it possible for it to actually reverse? Uh, it, it, where it would it, be drawing it, river water? It, it certainly will. If we have a flood and the river comes up during the time the post springs has either low or zero flow, water from the river will flow back into the spring. That's technically called an estevel, which is a spring that reverses flow direction. And that's, we have springs like that on the Santa Fe River already, but Poe has not in the past been one of those that was typically operating as a reverse flow spring. White Springs up uh, on the Suwannee River is in Estevel that's been flowing backwards since the 60s uh, due to declining spring flows. And so decline of rainfall is obviously a, a big effect on spring flows, and spring flows will come back when it starts raining again. But they never are coming back to the full flow that they had in the past, and this is clearly due to increased uses of groundwater throughout North Florida. We're pumping a very sizable fraction of our groundwater, maybe as much as 20% of the historic flow of all our springs is now being utilized through pumping of groundwater for agricultural and urban uh, land use practices. Uh, you had an interesting chart at the commission meeting that actually tracked rainfall over a much longer period of time. And it, did I hear you correctly that one of the points you were making is, you know, while we are experiencing a drought right now, that historically, if you look at it in a long period of time, that's not necessarily what's causing what's going on in the springs. Am I that, getting that right? That's right. We have about a 100-year uh, record of rainfall in North Florida. It's a, it's a very long record, but it's you know sort of minuscule when you look at geologic time. But that's the best we have. And during that 100-year period, we saw about a 50-year period of slightly rising rainfall levels. On average, big fluctuation around that. Average about 51 inches rain a year, but we have some years where there's 80 inches of rain and other years where there's 30 inches of rain. Um, but there's always, always been droughts during that whole record. But there was a general increasing trend until the 60s. In the 60s, that trend switched the other direction, and there's been a generally decreasing trend for the last 50 years. And the overall trend, if you look at the whole period of record, is, is level, or slightly increasing, actually, because of the rising first leg of the trend. But when you look at the short term, uh, we're in a, an increasing dry period right now. And we don't know where the end of that is. We don't know if that's just a decadal length cycle or it's something longer that is perhaps being caused by our water use right now. We are, we've drained off much of the surface water from this part of Florida through development and drainage. And now we've pumped the aquifer levels down significant amounts, which further drains surface water bodies. So our wetlands are tending to dry up for both of those reasons. And we may just have less rainfall from now on in North Florida because of those factors alone, not global warming, but 
just Florida development. So that, that's a scary prospect. If that's the case, we'll never see these spring flows come back to what they were before. But I do expect on you know, wet years and hurricane years, we're going to get some pretty substantial spring flows again, but not near the level we had before. We, we see an overall reduction of about 35 to 40 percent in the spring flows in the base flow of the Santa Fe River. You were also talking about the uh, different levels of nitrates that have been associated with the springs and the combination of the level going down but the nitrate levels uh, remaining high. And I guess that's not a great combination, is it? And now it's the double whammy, I think I probably called it. Um, yeah, at the same time we have declining spring flows pretty much across the board. We have increasing nitrate nitrogen levels across the board. And nitrate is invisible when it's dissolved in water. It's, you can't tell it's in the water by looking at it. You have to do a chemical test to see it. But algae and other plants that are growing in the water know that nitrate is there and they use it as a nutrient for their growth. That's one of the principal building blocks for plants and that's of course why we put it on the land to start with. We use it as a fertilizer. Uh, but uh, what's happened is the nitrate levels in some of our springs on the Santa Fe River have gone up as much as 3,000 percent, over 30 times increase in over nitrate what, levels. Over what period of time? Over the period you? of development mm -hmm. of the, you know, pre 1950s nitrate levels were pretty low in the Santa Fe River and the Santa Fe Springs. Uh, we estimated about 80 tons of nitrate. Nitrogen was going down the Santa Fe River historically during pre-development times. That, that was coming from rainfall. You have some nitrate in rainfall. We estimate now there's over 800 tons a year of nitrate going down the Santa Fe River. So it's 10 times higher nitrate than the, the long term for the whole river, that's the whole river. Some springs are much higher than that and some springs are lower depending on where they're drawing their water from. Now we are, we are taping this meeting on May 23rd, just to let folks know the time frame. Uh, I was on the internet this morning and I noticed there were a lot of very dramatic pictures about uh, the algae growth in the Santa Fe River. I think the pictures were near post springs, they were. as a matter of fact. And, uh, uh, I guess that's an effect of these nitrate levels that we can all see and, and touch. Well, I, I, you never have enough science to be sure of everything, anything, but I've been on and in the Santa Fe River for uh, over 30 years, and uh, the increasing prevalence of algal blooms in the Santa Fe River has been obvious to me over the last about 15 to 20 years of that period. Um, and that it corresponds with the increase in nitrate levels in the Santa Fe River. There's an increasing trend in nit nitrate levels in the Santa Fe River. Um, so the algal blooms, the types of algal blooms seen in the upper in that part of the Santa Fe River, are no doubt caused partly by the increase, the decreased flows. There's almost no flow in the Santa Fe River now above Bow Springs. There has been almost no flow in the Santa Fe River above Olino State Park for a year now. No flow none. There's no water going into that sinkhole and the river is not flowing. And so when you have stagnant conditions and you have these elevated nitrate levels, that's the, the perfect time for an algal br breakout, you know, an algal bloom. And, um, and that's what we're seeing in the Santa Fe. The algae that they're seeing is normally a planktonic algae that would only occur in lakes. But the Santa Fe River, essentially, since it stopped flowing, has turned into a lake. And it's a polluted lake because of the high nitrate levels. You know, something that I can't quite wrap my mind around is how much water is in the Florida aquifer. Um, is that something you can, you can explain to a layperson in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I think of it as trillions upon trillions of gallons of water. Um, how, how are human actions actually affecting that level? how are natural factors affecting that level, but I is that something that you can explain to somebody who doesn't understand the I will, science? I will take a shot at it. Okay. I will take a shot at it. The Florida aquifer, uh, the, the freshwater portion of it, is totally a response to recharge from rainfall. In other words, if it didn't rain in Florida, the Florida aquifer, the freshwater part of it, would drain out eventually, and you'd have nothing but salt water in the aquifer. And there have been times in Florida's prehistory when there was a lot less rain than we have now, 
And so there was a lot less aquifer at those times. Um, but it's this freshwater bubble that's in the Florida aquifer, it, it has to be constantly recharged to be constantly flowing out. And the, the outflow points, the discharge points, before human development were all the springs. So there's a certain amount of water going into the aquifer. There was, that amount of water was coming out of the aquifer in the springs. And that was what we consider the historic flow of these springs. It's somewhere around 10 billion gallons of water a day in all the springs, and all this thousand springs. That's just a real rough estimate of, of what the prehistoric spring flow was. That's no longer the case because there's another outlet for the Florida aquifer for that freshwater bubble, and that's pumping, which takes some of that water and like I said, it may be as much as 20%. In North Florida, we're pumping over 2 billion gallons a day of water. And there was 10 billion gallons coming out before. So I, just a rough ballpark estimate would be 20% of the water that formerly recharged those springs now isn't recharging. I mean, then if you put on top of that less rainfall, you're going to have even less available. So, but that doesn't explain that the, size, the massive size of the Florida aquifer. The Florida aquifer extends from all under Florida, all the whole state of Florida, all the way up into South Carolina, all through the coastal plain of Georgia and up into South Carolina. And people pump water from the Florida aquifer throughout most of its area of coverage. It's one of the biggest aquifers in the world. But that water's not really available to us unless we want to basically burn up our capital at the same time we're burning up our income. And uh, let me explain. It, there may be 500 feet of fresh water in the aquifer under Gainesville. It may be a little bit more than that. And that's mostly rock. It's not just all water. It's not right. like a big tub of water. It's, it's mostly rock. And there are pores in that rock that hold water and caves and things like that. And that's somewhere less than 20% of that total volume of 500 to 1,000 feet. But underneath that water lies salt water. And the, the fresh water holds that salt water down because of its weight, because of the thickness of it. If we pull just the top foot off of that aquifer, we get 40 foot rise in the salt water underneath the aquifer. And what you see in the coastal areas of Florida is more and more wells are going salty because of that. Even in Hastings, in the potato growing area, as far inland as Hastings now is finding salt water in their wells. Uh, I was just talking to a gentleman yesterday in Inglis, his well just turned to salt in the last week due to a combination of drought and pumping and lower flows in the rivers that normally recharge that part of the aquifer. So it, the aquifer is highly vulnerable. And, and the other important thing is the springs only get the water off the very top of the aquifer. They're skimming the top. And if the aquifer is lowered enough, the springs stop flowing. And it turns out the amount you need to lower the aquifer is probably less than 10 feet in most places. Just 10 foot reduction in the aquifer level and the springs stop flowing. So if we want to mine the aquifer uh, down below those levels, we will have no springs, and they will all be reversed flow, you know, when the rivers flood. I like your analogy of it's almost like you're spending the principal if you're taking too much water out. Um, what, are, what are you recommending? What did you recommend to the county commission? I mean, given this science, given what you know about this, are there practical steps that you're recommending to, uh, to various government and or private organizations uh, to, to help mitigate this? OK, I, I, yes, there certainly are. And uh, there are things we can do. All these problems are, can be rectified, but uh, they will take various amounts of sacrifice, depending on who you are. Uh, the first thing we need to do is to get our public to appreciate the severity of these issues. And that's why I've been writing pieces for the newspaper and appearing in TV interviews and things like that. And the second thing is to go to our elected officials and convince them of the amount of science we have and the, the way that science points right now is to serious problems. And there really is a consensus on that. What there isn't a consensus on at our water management districts in our Florida Department of Environmental Protection is how to, what to do about that. And in fact, there's a general denial that, uh, that anything but rainfall is really at fault for the reduction of spring flows. And there's a, there's a very um, uh, painful reluctance at our State Department of Environmental Protection to really do anything that requires a reduction in nitrogen loading that would help clean up the springs so they didn't have these algal problems. 
because a lot of that nitrogen loading is coming from agricultural operations. So to actually solve the problems, we need to pump less water, not more water. I mean, that's, that's just plain and simple. We're already pumping more than the springs can withstand. They're turning into cesspools and sinkholes because of the amount we're pumping now. We need to pump less water. That means everybody needs to pull back on how much water they use. And the easiest place to start is to just stop irrigating landscape and yards and things like that. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do, and it would make a, a tremendous difference right now. The next, the biggest target is agriculture, though, of course. And, and then everybody has water use, but most of our water use is outside, not inside the house. So we're using really high-quality water to grow grass, basically. Uh, so on the, on the water quantity side, those are the things we need to do. On the water quality side, we need to stop using fertilizer wherever we can. Another thing, if you're not fertilizing your landscaping, you would make a significant dent in the amount of nitrogen that's getting into the groundwater. And then, of course, agriculture is, is agriculture, I love agriculture. I live in the country. I've had grown almost a lot of crops myself, including animals. And I, I, I think farming is a great thing for people to be doing and something, of course, that's very important, especially local farming. But farming in North Florida is becoming more and more industrialized. It's becoming big farms, big operations, and they're all based on maximum profit, and most of them. I shouldn't say all. Many of them are based on maximizing profit. And the way to do that is to use free water, no charge. You can pump essentially as much as you want from the aquifer to raise your profit for your crop. And there are better crops than that. Nobody irrigated from gra the ground. 50, 60 years ago in North Florida, but we had an agricultural economy here mm -hmm. during that time. So we need to roll s some things back to wiser use of both the water and the nitrogen that is, we're so wasteful of. Do you have suggestions on how to better manage water, for example, in agricultural uh, operations? I, I think we need to put the right crop in the right place, mm -hmm. and that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing people growing watermelons and corn and soybeans and on, on highly drain soils that use tremendous amounts of water. Uh, if you put those same crops on areas to the, in the eastern part of the county, the, the aquifer is really protected in the eastern part of the county by the Hawthorne formation, the clay formation. And I know those areas aren't the best place to grow watermelons, but you can grow other crops there that will, even if you fertilize them, the fertilizer doesn't get to the ground. So that's one way to do it. And also you wouldn't have to use as much water because they tend to hold more water in the soil. So. It's putting the right crops in the right place. And the area where we're doing most of our farming is, and the only reason we're doing that intensive farming in these areas is because the groundwater is so available right now. It's so free. We should be putting uh, what I think longleaf pine plantations and forestry in those areas. That's what was there historically when the Florida aquifer was pristine. Uh, they don't use water. They don't use excess water. And they, they strip any nitrogen out of the rainfall that falls on the land. So if, as long as you have a crop that's not fertilized and not um, using irrigation, you know, groundwater, it's the right crop. And unfortunately, it's not going to be an easy thing to make those special interests change their ways other than hopefully a conscience. You know, that may be the only thing that really, if they understood what they're, the problems that are being caused, then they may want to make changes themselves. And uh, that's why we produce this, this re restoration action plan. I hope farmers will read it the same way the rest of the public will. We are just about out of time, but certainly one item that's in the news is the Adena uh, Ranch. Is, am I pronouncing that correctly? That's correct. Uh, in Ocala. And uh, I know that you've had conversations about that. There was a short conversation about that at our commission meeting. Uh, can you just, for the viewers who may not know about that, explain what that situation is? Yeah, this is um, a very large agricultural operation. Once again, I have to say it's an industrial farm. It includes um, 10,000 acres of pasture uh, for year-round production of 30,000 cows a year. And it includes a slaughterhouse at the end of the pasture so that the cows live out their whole life in a series of pastures and end up at the slaughterhouse, which is a merciful way to create hamburger and, and you know, and good quality meat. I, I have no problem with the idea of it. Uh, I would be a hypocrite if I did. Um, 
but I should mention that this is not in Alachua County. This not, is Marion County. But it's in it's in the spring shed that uh, is tied to Alachua County, the spring shed for the Silver Springs. Uh, it's right outside of Ocala. It's actually 30,000 acres of land, and the um, owner has requested 100, uh, permits for 134 or 135 wells to pump a total an average daily flow. This is the average over the whole year. It's not something he's going to do once a month of 13.26 million gallons a day. 13.26 million gallons a day. That's several million gallons a day higher than the average flow used by the whole city of Ocala. And 30,000 cows is roughly equivalent. You can say about 11 people per cow. Uh, 11 yeah, per people per cow in terms of the waste produced is, is equivalent to the nitrogen load from about 330,000 additional people living in Marion County. And the owner uh, is, you know, saying he doesn't want to have any impact on the environment. He wants to be a good environmental steward. And that's a great thing to hear. But the project's got a life of its own. The land has either been cleared or is being cleared. The slaughterhouse is being built. The permit for the water hasn't even been issued, but the Department of Environmental Protection has issued all the permits for water quality. And the Marion County Commission has approved this project in spite of the fact that Silver Springs is one of the most endangered springs in the state right now. The biggest spring historically in the state of Florida and, and probably in the world. It's endangered by uh, reduced flows and high nitrate levels, incredibly reduced flows. The current flow in Silver Springs right now is one-third of its long-term average. So who, what entity? is the approval resting the, the, with? It's with the St. John's River Water Management District. They have to either approve or, or this permit uh, or the applicant needs to revise it and come in for a lower amount. They need to approve that. They feel like they have to approve this permit. And remember, Adina hasn't drawn one gallon out of the aquifer yet, really did a little bit for testing. But silver is already really messed up and really in, in dire condition. Uh, and the economy of Silver Springs is just in the, in the trash can because of it. The park is not a popular place. The, the attraction wants to get out of there because it doesn't make money, because Silver Springs isn't what it used to be. And they haven't drawn any water yet. So their, their permit is just represents all the bad permits that have already been issued, all the permits that allowed greater groundwater withdrawals and higher nitrogen loads than should have ever been issued in the past. And, and so that's why there's a a rally around that permit now to oppose it. And there's a hopeful uh, feeling out there that the owner of this operation, Frank Stronach, is actually does want to be a good citizen. And he has the opportunity to be a good citizen, but it won't be going forward with that project the way it's currently designed. Well, <laughs> on that optimistic note, uh, <laughs> we've run out of time, but thank you so thank much you for coming much. on. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Boldly go to socialsecurity.gov. Help yourself or someone you love. It's eminently logical.